In the last 48 hours, we have had two major model releases and about 10 hours worth of interviews from top leaders about them, the insights of which I will try to condense into just 15 minutes or so. Because Gemini 3 Flash is Google's attempt at finally convincing you to switch from ChatGPT or Claude, and the results look incredible. I'll go through them in a moment, but we have two co-founders of Google DeepMind, both seeing the LLM paradigm continuing on this exponential until a sketched out proto-AGI model arrives in not too long. However, there are some problems with that vision, and one result in particular I don't want you to miss. So let's get started. Here are some of the raw numbers. And bear in mind that the Flash version of Gemini is the quick version, the one that can answer almost instantly. You guys will know that all companies have a pro version of their models that typically take much, much longer, minutes often, to answer a question. I want you to notice the comparison with the model released two days ago, Gemini 3 Flash, with the state-of-the-art model as of June of this year, Gemini 2.5 Pro. Whether we're talking about academic reasoning, visual reasoning, scientific knowledge, code mathematics, the results aren't even that close. And this is for the dramatically quicker model. For example, even without access to tools, the new Gemini 3 Flash roughly halves the error rate in one very difficult mathematics benchmark, AIM. Again, this is comparing summer's Gemini 2.5 Pro at 88% to two days ago's Gemini 3 Flash at 95.2%. In fact, in almost any domain you can point to from table and chart analysis, video analysis, or going off and being an agents, Gemini 3 Flash exceeds the previous huge model performance from the summer. You can, of course, optimize models for one particular set of benchmarks. And we learned just this morning that Google did indeed apply a special type of post training to optimize performance for software engineering. For those who code, you may be somewhat incredulous to see Gemini 3 Flash outperforming Gemini 3 Pro, the heavier model released just a few weeks ago. It would be very easy to get carried away with those results and say ChatGPT is doomed for consumers and Gemini, as Jim Cramer points out, is growing much faster. Given that Jim Cramer is wrong about so much, the head of applied research at OpenAI took this as a great sign for ChatGPT. But the reality is always more complex than the headlines make it seem because Gemini 3 Flash is indeed a great model, but it does have a key weakness. And if ChatGPT was dying, that's definitely news to investors who keep valuing OpenAI higher and higher and higher. Now, before we get to the proto AG sketched out by Demis Asabis and another co-founder of DeepMind. I just want to spend a moment more on Gemini 3 Flash because there is a secret about AI model releases that I want all of you guys to be aware of when you see a new model announced. The secret is that models are rarely punished for incorrect answers. They are not incentivized to say, I don't know. So companies like OpenAI and Google DeepMind and Anthropic are heavily incentivized to instruct their models, keep trying, think for longer and longer and longer. Self-correct, try something else, do anything to get a final answer. Here's one example with a benchmark testing 6,000 questions of knowledge and factual recall. You may be able to see that Gemini 3 Flash beats all other models, including Gemini 3 Pro, the heavier model that thinks for longer, beating GPT 5.2 and Grok 4 and anyone else you can name. At least if you measure the proportion of correctly answered questions out of all of the questions in the benchmark. However, Models are given the choice of saying, I don't know. And that's a choice that Gemini 3 Flash rarely makes. Of the questions Gemini 3 Flash couldn't get right, 91% of the time, it was because it had outputted the incorrect answer. You could say hallucinated the incorrect answer. Only 9% of the time did it not attempt the question or just give a partial answer. That compares, for example, to GPT 5.1, where it was about 50-50 saying, I don't know, versus getting it wrong. When you're asking a model a question, would you prefer a slightly higher percentage of accurate answers, but a much greater chance of confabulation or hallucination, or slightly fewer correct answers, but much more honest I don't knows. OpenAI in September went further, saying we have an epidemic of penalizing uncertain responses from large language models. To address this, we need a socio-technical mitigation. We need to start rewarding and celebrating models that say they don't know versus always attempting to give you any answer they can and claim it's correct. If you're interested, I did a full video on that paper on my Patreon in September. Many people might be tempted to go to the other 
extreme and say, well, all those Gemini 3 results are fake and overhyped. But eventually figuring out the pattern inside of complex data is what you'd want, for example, in drug discovery. Or take visual reasoning puzzles. It's no wonder that the Gemini 3 Flash series does so well in Arc AGI 2. That's a test of finding a pattern in data that's extremely unlikely to be inside the training data of these models. Gemini 3 Flash can afford to spend so much time thinking because the cost per token is so much lower than for comparable models. Some people will say still these benchmarks are irrelevant because the models are just training on those benchmarks. The answers have leaked into their training data. But we have external benchmarks, private benchmarks, and just one among many of those is my own simple bench. It asks hundreds of often trick questions that usually have a spatial reasoning component to them. You can see that the new Gemini 3 Flash gets 61.1%, which is comparable with the much heavier and slower models like Claude Opus 4.5 and GPT-5 Pro. Unless Google are breaching their own terms and conditions, they haven't gamed this benchmark and it's not a fake model. It genuinely is pretty smart. Many of you though will be aware that OpenAI recently released GPT 5.2 and I did a whole video on it and it's particularly focused on coding and the sciences. Sam Altman really wants one of his models to discover new science. But it kind of makes sense that if you have a smaller model that's cheaper to serve to almost a billion people and optimize it for coding and the sciences that it might not do as well as other models or even some of their own previous models on a trick question or spatial reasoning benchmark like Simple Bench. So I actually wasn't even that surprised when I saw that GPT 5.2 underperformed GPT 5.1 and GPT 5 on my own Simple Bench. Some of OpenAI's own staffers apparently were though saying feels like something's wrong with a test setup or system prompt mismatch or something. This is despite the system prompt being identical for every single model tested. We also average performance across multiple runs. And just because I saw this tweet and the reaction to it, I redid the entire run and got very similar results again for GPT 5.2 and Gemini 3. And you know what? Just yesterday, OpenAI released GPT 5.2 Codex, their model optimized for coding. And in one of their own internal benchmarks, it scored lower than their previous iteration, GPT 5.1 Codex. You can almost think of this benchmark as being a very indirect test of an ability to self-improve. It's a machine learning engineering benchmark and GPT 5.2 Codex got 10%, whereas GPT 5.1 Codex Max got 17%. Maybe 5.2 Codex spends less time and tokens thinking, we don't know, but the point is the reality is always more complex than the headlines. Maybe Demis Hassabis can shed some light as to why Google Gemini models tend to do a bit better on Simple Bench and what the path forward looks like. I watched or listened to all almost 10 hours worth of interviews with the heads of Google DeepMind and OpenAI to bring you just the highlights. And this first one relates directly to Simple Bench. On screen has been a question that's very typical of those found within my benchmark, but here's Hasabis. At the moment, he said the physics understanding within models is very approximate. Yes, with, with the with when you're trying to train a simmer agent, you don't want genie hallucinating kind of physics that are wrong. So actually what we're doing now is we're almost creating a phys physics benchmark where we can use game engines, which are very accurate with physics, to create lots of fairly simple, like the sorts of things you would do in your physics A-level uh, lab uh, lessons, right? Like, you know, rolling little balls down different tracks and seeing how fast they go. And so, like, really teasing apart on a very basic uh, level, like Newt Newton's three laws of motion, has it encapsulated it? Um, whether that's VO or Genie, have these models encapsulated the physics of that 100% accurately? And right now they're not, they're kind of approximations and they look um, realistic when you just casually look at them. At the moment, Google DeepMind are training separate models to better simulate and understand the physical world, like Genie 3. I did an entire video on this model, but essentially can simulate any environment, including gaming environments, and you can move about and interact with those environments. And it remembers what you you did inside those environments for up to a minute at least. Separate from that, Google DeepMind have trained Simmer 2, which is a gaming companion or an agent, as they say, that plays, reasons and learns with you in virtual 3D worlds. I hope you're keeping track. That's Genie 3 that can imagine any world and Simmer 2, which can play within those worlds. Construct long-term plans and then act on them with actual commands going into a computer. You may have also heard of Nano Banana Pro, which I think is still the state-of-the-art model 
tool for image generation, creating an image just from text. Now, yes, I do know that OpenAI just came out with GPT 5.1, and I have spent some time comparing those two models, but I still think Nano Banana Pro just edges it out for me. It's at least very close, but that's not even the point I wanted to make. Because Google can, of course, also turn an image into a video with their VO 3.1 model, which many of you may have played about with, which means I'm almost losing track of the number of different systems that Google is working on for simulation. And Demis Asabis revealed that they want to bring them all together. That, for him, would be a prototype AGI. Across everything that's happening in, in AI at the moment, the language models, the world models, you know, and so on, what's closest to your vision of AGI? I think actually the combination of, obviously there's Gemini 3, which I think is very capable, but the Nano Banana Pro system we also launched last week, which is an advanced version of our image creation tool. What's really amazing about that, it has also Gemini under the hood. So it can understand not just images, it sort of understands uh, what's going on semantically in those images. So it has some kind of deep understanding of mechanics and and what make what you know makes up parts of objects, what's materials, and it can you know render text really really uh, accurately now. So I think that's sort of um, it's getting towards a kind of AGI for imaging. Um, I think it's uh, a kind of general purpose system that can do anything across images. So I think that's very exciting. And then the advances in in world models, you know, Genie and Simmer, and what we're doing there, and then eventually we got to kind of converge all of those different, they're kind of different projects at the moment and they're, they're, they're intertwined, but we need to, you know, converge them all into one, one big model. And then that might be start becoming, you know, candidate for proto AGI. The timing of that quote proto AGI and the bringing together of all of those disparate systems would coincide with two more years of scaling our current paradigm. Everything, in other words, that has taken us from the GPT-3 model that barely anyone used via the API to Gemini 3 today. And that continued investment, according to another co-founder of DeepMind, Shane Legg, will lead to quote minimal AGI. I know that you don't think that AGI should be this this single yes, no, like a threshold that you cross, but 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 more of a, a sort of spectrum, as it were, that you have these levels. Just just talk me through that. Yeah, so I have um, what I call minimal AGI, and that's when you have an artificial agent that it can at least do all sorts of cognitive things that we would typically expect people to be able to do. And um, we're not there yet, but it could be one year, it could be five years, I'm guessing probably about two or so. So that's the lowest level then. That's the my, minimal what, I, what AGI. I call minimal AGI. Mm. That's the point at which I'd say, okay, this AI is no longer failing in ways that we would find surprising if we gave a person that cognitive task. And I think that's the that's the minimum bar. Now, that doesn't mean we understand fully how to reach the capabilities of human intelligence, because you can have extraordinary people who who go and do amazing you know, cognitive feats, inventing new theories in physics or maths or developing, you know, incredible symphonies or doing all the writing, amazing literature and so on. Um, and just because our AI can do what's typical of human cognition doesn't necessarily mean we know all the recipes and algorithms, everything required to achieve um, very extraordinary feats of human cognition. So predictable, he thinks, is the return on investment from increased compute. He's actually had that prediction of a 2028 minimal AGI since 2009. I think I want to end with your now quite famous prediction about AGI. And you have stayed incredibly consistent on this um, for over a decade, in fact. You have said that there is a 50-50 chance of AGI by 2028. Yes. Is that, that's minimal AGI? Yes. Wow. And um, are you still 50-50 by 2028? Yes. And 2028. About, and you can see that on my blog from 2009. And what do you think about full AGI? What's your timeline for that? Uh, there's some years later. Could be three, four, five, six years later. At this point, many of you watching may be thinking, damn, this is a trend that is worth spending more time analysing. And I wouldn't be surprised if a huge chunk of the papers I've covered over the last two years on this channel haven't involved contributors who are alumni of the MATS program. They are the sponsors of today's video and they find and train researchers working on one of the most 
talent-constrained problems in the world, reducing risks from unaligned AI. The thing is, their alumni have gone on to work at places like Meta, Anthropic, DeepMind, and more. Just personally, I think it would be pretty meta if the technical researchers who apply this year via the link in the description end up doing the security and alignment work that gets featured on this channel in future. As you might expect, the program also comes with world-class mentorship, a stipend, compute budget, and full cost coverage. Again, way more info via the link in the description. There is one thing I do at this stage want to point out though, which is that underlying investment exponential going into the training costs and research costs that underpin that progress. That exponential can't carry on forever. Here's an exclusive look from the information about OpenAI's planned compute spend and focus on the darker red research and development compute cost because it does continue to more or less double until 2027 or so, perhaps going into 2028, but it stops doubling from there. It's more like a linear investment increase from there on out, from say 40 billion to 45 to 50 billion from 2028 to 2030. Yes, of course, there can be research breakthroughs in that period, but the X exponential scaling of the underlying paradigm would have stopped. And Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, in a great interview with Alex Kantrowitz, released around 12 hours ago, hinted at the same reduced percentage going into training the models from that point onwards. We have always been in a compute deficit. It is always constrained what we're able to do. Uh, I unfortunately think it will always be the case, but I wish it were less the case, and I'd like to get it to be less of the case over time, because uh, I think there's so many great products and services that we can deliver and it'll be a great business. Okay, so it's effectively training costs go down. As a percentage. They as go up massively overall. But yeah. And then your expectation is through things like these, this enterprise push, through things like people being willing uh, to pay for ChatGPT through the API, OpenAI will be able to grow revenue enough to pay for it with revenue. Yeah, that is the plan. Indeed, his co-founder, Greg Brockman, recently bemoaned the fact that so much compute had to go to serving users what some of you may call AI slop, instead of pushing research forwards. We are absolutely bursting at the seams with demand for compute relative to our ability to supply that compute. When we look at our launch calendar, the, the single biggest blocker often becomes, okay, but where's the compute going to come from for that? When we had our image generation launch in March that went viral, we did not have enough compute to keep that going. And so we made some very painful decisions to take a bunch of compute from research and move it to our deployment to try to be able to meet the demand. And that was really sacrificing the future for the present. And this is, first of all, a very painful thing because we have so many features, so many products that we want to launch that get held back because we didn't have enough compute. And that what we do not want is to be caught flat-footed where we say, well, two years ago, three years ago, we should have been planning for more. We want to be ahead of the curve. And the truth is, I do not think we will be, no matter how ambitious we can dream of being right now. I think that the demand will far exceed whatever we, we can think of. Remember as well that that exponential relies on more and more data. And according again to the information, more and more specialist companies are refusing to sell their data to OpenAI and Anthropic. Quote, most of the life science and accounting companies have said no because they have such proprietary data sets that are unique to them. In fact, Reuters reports that companies like OpenAI and Google are increasingly tussling to get their hands on user data. The more training data they can get, the more they can fuel that exponential. Even Google, with access to Chrome, YouTube, Waymo, Android, and so much more, see a new paradigm emerging. Here's Sebastian Borgode, one of the pre-training leads for Gemini 3. Are we running out of data? I, I don't think so, so there's more. Um, we, we can we are definitely working on that as well. Um, but more than that, I think what might be happening instead is kind of a shift in paradigm where before we were kind of scaling in the data unlimited regime where where data would scale as much as you'd like. And we're kind of shifting more to a data limited regime, which actually changes a lot of the research and how we think about problems. So scale will help to make your model better. And what's nice about scale, it, it, it does so fairly predictably. And, and that's kind of what the, the scaling laws tell us is as you scale the model, how much better will the model actually be? But this is only one part. The, the other parts are architecture and, and data innovation. Um, these also play a really, really important part in, in, in the performance of, of pre-training and probably even more so than, than, than pure scale these days. But scaling is still 
uh, an, import, an important factor as well. It could well be that we may end up needing to simulate worlds to get the data we need for that proto-AGI system. Now, I must confess that I have saved a few juicy snippets from these and other interviews for my year in review almost, which is the next video that I plan to make before the end of the year. But I do hope I've conveyed the key threads, the key tensions and trends that have emerged with these new model releases and surrounding interviews. I, for one, think that the next two years are going to be very, very interesting in AI. Thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day.